Bad Boy Bill, born and raised in Chicago, Bad Boy Bill has been a name synonymous with house music long before it captivated the world. His astounding natural ability behind the decks led him to enter and win numerous DJ battles as well as placing in multiple DMC championships. Bill's talents were noticed immediately and his mixes blasted through the airwaves of Chicago's most respected uh, radio stations. Bill's groundbreaking hot mix series of mixes set the standard for today's mixtapes. With over one million combined sales of all his mixes, Bill quickly grew to become one of the world's top DJs, eventually being voted America's favorite DJ in 2003 and 2006. Give it up for that. <laughs> Aside from his intensive tour schedule, Bill has produced and remixed hundreds of songs. Recent projects include a full-length album appropriately named The Album, as well as a steady stream of chart-topping singles. Never leaving his fan base at a loss for new mixes, Bill also produces a one-of-a-kind monthly radio show called Behind the Decks. Aside from his musical contributions, Bill is also one of the original founders of Beatport.com, which is currently the world's leading download site for electronic dance music. In an industry that's notoriously fickle and uh, regularly dethrones its top DJs for the next big thing, Bad Boy Bill has consistently stayed ahead of the pack. His innovation has shaped the industry, not just behind the decks, but in every aspect of the business. Bad Boy Bill is the rare embodiment of past, present, and future. He will always be a legend for his contribution to the EDM world. He is lauded for what he is doing today and the industry and his legions of fans are always wondering what he will do next. Ladies and gentlemen, from USA, by way of Chicago, give it up for Bad Boy Bill. What's up, how's everybody doing? <laughs> A nice yeah. crowd here. Shot one, two. Come on, candy man. Come on. <laughs> That's for after we go through these questions. So, so uh, good start. how you guys doing? I'm Transit, for those of you guys that uh, don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I'm privileged enough to be able to teach uh, one of the production classes here at SCC, um, Ableton Live. Uh, we do that on Wednesday nights, and on Thursdays, I actually teach digital DJ with uh, Rob Wagner here. So um, Rob also teaches some other DJ classes as well. I'm UC135, which is the introductory class, and I'm also the program director for our DJ certificate, and I also help students with internships. So. And then uh, Candyman right here teaches uh, one of the world's, probably the world's first, right? Number one first, uh, what? What's the, what's the best The art of emceeing slash rapping. Number one class in the world, baby. <laughs> respect the DJ, respect the DJ. So uh, I guess what we're gonna do is uh, we're just gonna go back and forth, me and Rob, and uh, just ask some questions to Bill. I think uh, we came up with uh, a number of questions that have been going through everyone's mind for everyone that's sitting here right now. So we'll try to cover those as best we can. And then at the end, we'll kind of turn it over and bring the mic out to you guys if we didn't cover any questions and you guys can uh, ask any specific questions to Bill that you guys want to. So uh, should I start? Go ahead. Yes. All right. So Bill, thanks for coming first off. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. We've been uh, working really hard to make this happen, so uh, I'm happy to see so many people here today. Um, so first off, man, um, there's a sudden explosion of uh, DJ culture in the industry right now. Uh, everyone's wanting to become a DJ, seeing that uh, a lot of the equipment companies are making it so easy and accessible for newcomers to uh, jump right in with laptops and CDJs and whatnot. Um, and be able to DJ without having to learn like the basic fundamentals of DJing. Like, how, how do you feel about that? You know, there's good and bad to that. I mean, it's the good part is 
it allows a lot of people to be able to share music. And I think that's really the ultimate job of a DJ is to search and find the music that you love and then actually share it with people and be able to present it in a way that makes people, you know, have a good time. Uh, the bad of it is, you know, if you really don't know what you're doing and you're just kind of using the whole press play mentality and standing up there and, and it be kind of becomes, you know, sitting behind a computer and just not really having an emotional connection and it's kind of lifeless and you really can't redirect uh, like a DJ would. He can read the crowd, he can start redirecting and, and all that stuff and those are the skills that you have, you know, it takes time to learn. Awesome, awesome. Okay, Bill, next question. Do you recommend that DJs learn how to produce and producers learn how to DJ? And if so, why? I think absolutely. I mean, right now, uh, you know, if you want to become a touring DJ, you're going to have to learn how to produce because the DJs that are getting the touring gigs are basically because of their strength of their production. So you can go from being an unknown DJ making tracks in your bedroom to all of a sudden playing all around the world if your songs are charting on Beatport and, and, and doing well enough. So I think it's very important if you want to uh, really have a long career DJing, you have to start almost with production now. Um, as far as producers learning to DJ, that's you know something else that's very important because the guys that are producing the tracks, if you start as a producer, you're gonna start getting offers uh, to DJ and you don't wanna go out there and, and look bad. You wanna do a good show, you wanna give people you know, a, a good time for you know, when they bring you out. So I think it's very important both ways. Um, you know, for both people to, to, to learn those skills. I think uh, one of the first times I got to, to play with you, man, um, it was like that starstruck moment, you know, in the green room, like, here's my mix, man, you know, like, what do I need to do to get to where you're at? And the first thing that you said to me was, you got to learn to produce, man. you got to put your music out. And that was about, what, eight years ago, wow. seven years ago. So and that stuck in my head all this whole time, bro. That's awesome. So, definitely. Um, so, uh how are music artists making money in 2013 as far as DJs and whatnot? Um, I think most DJs are still making the bulk of their money off of touring. Um, unless you're an artist maybe like Zed or somebody who's working with Lady Gaga, then you start making money off of producing and, and royalties and, and publishing for your writing. Um, you know, there's money to be made in downloads, but until you hit like uh, iTunes and like the top 10 or something like Swedish House Mafia with Don't You Worry Child I'm sure is making a lot of money on downloads but most Beatport downloads and stuff like that aren't really generating tons of money so it would almost have to be uh, a pop crossover hit for you to make money on downloads so I would say the most of the money though is being made touring Would you say that um, with Beatport and uh, online digital stores like that that it's mo mainly DJs and producers who are buying stuff off there and just the general public is more iTunes related and Amazon or it, it seems that way it seems that it's mostly DJs who use Beatport um, there are some you know regular consumers but I think they kind of gravitate towards iTunes because it's the radio edits and and shorter versions um, I don't think somebody in their iPod wants a two-minute intro you know of beats you know before they get to the song so uh, yeah, so I think, um, you know, uh, they're very important. The, the bad part about uh, the whole digital era is is just the sharing of music for free and basically having no value and just co people copying hard drives and stuff like that. Because they don't realize that it takes a lot of time and effort to put these songs out. And there's a very small labels and, and DJs that are just coming out. So when you do that, you're kind of, you know, cutting, cutting off their, their chance to be able to make money at doing what they love. Bill, what do you recommend for a new music producer to go about getting signed on a label? It's a good question. I mean, the first thing you have to do is really get your studio skills up to par. You know, it's going to take time. Your first few tracks you make, you know, you might as well throw them in the garbage because it's not happening. You know what I mean? It's going to take some time. And I know you want to, you know, get them out there and, and stuff, but it's, it, it takes some time to get to, you know, producing is a whole different animal. You know, it's not, you just don't wake up and all of a sudden you're a dope producer. It, it takes time. Uh, but once you do have that, you know, get your get your sound quality up there, and then you know, start putting given to blogs. You know, put it on your SoundCloud, uh, and then you know, if you think you're ready, find a label that has a similar style to that the music you're making, and send the AR, find out who the AR guy is, and send them some links to your music. And uh, you know, the key to that is make sure make sure you're ready for that because you don't want to send them some stuff that's not good and then they get another email from you a month later and you're like oh, i'm not even gonna listen to this guy i heard the guys you know so make sure your stuff's at the right level before you send it and then um and the other big the big point about that as well is 
these A&R guys are getting tons of demos every week to listen to. So make sure you get to the point of your track quicker. You don't have to have a three minute intro and then it gets to the point. So get to the point quick and, and make sure your sound quality and all that stuff is up to par. Good points, man, good points. So uh, in the green room, we talked a little bit about uh, dubstep and what your thoughts on that was. Um, where do you kind of see the electronic dance music scene going in the next few years? I mean, you've been in the game for so long now, man. Not not that you're old or anything <laughs> like that, but you know, you've seen it all, man. You no, know, you've seen it come and go a couple yeah, times. Yeah, it goes in circles and cycles. It keeps like spinning around and reinventing itself. But that's what's cool about electronic music. You know, it started out as Chicago house music, and then transformed into Detroit techno, and then transformed into all these different genres, hip house, and so that's what's cool about electronic. You never know where it's going to go. I can't even predict that. It's 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 the creativity of the, you know, 15-year-old kid right now that's sitting with Ableton in his studio that's going to come up with what the next sound of electronic music is going to be, and that's what's pretty cool. Okay, Bill, how important are social networking websites such as Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and so forth to the success of new artists and or DJs? Are there any risks to the artist's growth by networking on these sites? I, th I think 100%. You know, I, right now, uh, Facebook and Twitter, uh, you know, by gaining likes and gaining Twitter followers, it's going to show promoters and stuff that people want to come out and actually support you and, and see you DJ. So it's very important in their eyes if they're going to book you. You know, how many? You know, do you have a buzz? Do you have some some followers? Um, more importantly, too, is just you know getting your SoundCloud up there, getting some music out there, get people downloading your music, um, and and being in touch with the blogs and all, all the whole social media thing is very important. So um, <clears throat> we spoke a little bit about like iTunes and Beatport and Amazon. Um, with all the negatives going on with people sharing music, are there any positives to any of that? The digital era at all? Yeah, I mean, the, no, the positives are, you know, the biggest thing for me is when I owned a record label uh, and we were putting out vinyl, uh, what would happen was is there was so many labels out there putting out so much vinyl that the record stores would be like, listen, I can't reorder your record because there's, you know, 20 new releases or 50 new releases this week. So we'll, we just don't have the space. So, you know, a lot of times people would go to the record store trying to buy a new record that we had put out and it's not in stock. So Beatport has alleviated that issue. You know, it's like it's always in stock. It's always downloadable, um, which I think was a big problem for for small labels and just getting the distribution properly. Now you could, you know, get it to Beatport and everybody around the globe can download it. So I think that's the that's the biggest benefit. Bill, how different has the DJ changed and evolved since the days of playing records on B96? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the biggest the biggest change that I've seen is when we first started mixing on the radio, whether it was WBMX or WGCI or, or later B96, there wasn't a lot of options. You know, people had to tune into our radio station to hear the latest dance music, the stuff that we were buying on vinyl that was coming in from imports or wherever it was coming from. And we would create these mixes. And that was, unless you were going out to the record store and buying vinyl, you wouldn't be able to hear this stuff. So I think now it's like you have, you know, Spotify, you have, you know, Sirius, you have internet radio stations, there's, you know, a million podcasts, there's a million ways for you to listen to music. So it kind of made the radio station mix show less important because there's, you know, there's a million ways that you can hear electronic music and it's, um, which is good, but it's, it just takes the focus away from one specific outlet. So uh, if you had to relive three of your biggest moments in your career, what three would those be? Uh, <laughs> That's a, that's a tough one. You know, I think the first time, you know, I was 16 when I got on the radio. Um, Farley Jack Master Funk had put me on. He was starting a mix show, and he was like, I kind of did an a impromptu audition for him, and he uh, put me on the radio. So the, I was 16 years old. I made this mix in my bedroom on this reel-to-reel -reel that I had had to buy because I, I didn't even know what I was, you know, I was using cassettes before that. And um, when I was driving away, I had given it to him, and later that night when I was driving in my car, my mix came on the radio. That was pretty cool. You know, I was like, man, I just made this and now it's being broadcast on WGCI, which is one of the biggest stations in Chicago. Um, so that was pretty, pretty cool uh, moment. So that's one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I would say I had produced a song called Yolanda uh, with a group called Reality. So I produced an, uh, that song and 
when that song got added in rotation, it was getting played on a bunch of pop stations around the country. The first time I heard it in rotation, I heard it on B96, and I was, it kind of bugged me out, because it was like daytime, and a song that I literally just produced and mixed down, and I, I mean, I did basically everything on the song. I had a keyboardist play some keyboards, but beyond that, it was all my MPC, my samplers, and everything, and, and I mixed it down at this, um, this studio. And to hear that on the radio in rotation was a pretty cool, feeling, you know? I know Candyman has probably the similar feeling about that. Kind of remember that day. <laughs> kind of remember. We, uh, we actually, my, it's always going to be the same for you guys. And hopefully everybody in here gets to experience that feeling. Like I only, my, I tell everybody out here to dream big because I only had a little dream and that was to be on 1580K day. <laughs> That was the station. That was the station in LA. That's the only dream I had. I got to be on 1580K Day. So it was real it was a lot of talent. So, you know, like he said, I just I worked really hard to get one song on 1580K Day. And when you hear it, it's like, oh, it is the greatest feeling in the world. You know, if it goes no further than that, you're cool. You could you could go ahead and say my bucket <laughs> list is full. I got That's on true. the radio. So yeah, That's I definitely true. know what that yeah. feels like. We are going to ask John to now go over here and ask students. Let's do it. Um, if, but I mean, while John is going down there, I'm going to quickly give this to Bill. Roughly 10 years ago, Bill gave me this really cool shirt that I'm wearing tonight behind the decks. And I wanted to pay back Bill by giving him a artichoke t-shirt. So Bill, <laughs> please. Oh, man. Thank you. Thank you. Go artichokes. <laughs> yes, Bill, our, our mascot is an artichoke. You got to rock it, Bill. Don't play us. I love it. I love it. You, you got to put that on, man. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> all right, guys. What we're going to do now is actually let you guys come to me. I refuse to step all over you. But if we can form maybe a line over this way, we want some good questions. We need some crowd participation. This is what... Bad boy Bill came out here for, and you guys are students, so now if you really want to pick his brain of something that you have an interest, you, you're all interested in music, obviously, or dance, or something that pertains to what he does. So I need you to make, start making your way over to me, so therefore we can uh, ask some very good questions, as I expect from all of you that I know. Don't be shy. This is what he's here for. Please do not be shy. Come over here and ask... Bad Boy Bill, pick his brain for the knowledge that he has. There's gems in there, trust me. I have a question while we're getting everybody lined up right. to, to come and ask me a question. Okay, so I'm sure everybody here is talented enough to get to the point where they get a song on the radio or one of those things. But I want you to let them know that you have to tour, obviously, to promote these songs. Now, would you let them know a little bit of what they will be in for? Because I, I, there, I've been places where I've been deathly ill. Right. You know, I think Australia. I got so sick. Yeah. You know, uh, let them know what they're in for as far as trying to keep their health intact with a rigorous schedule like you have. No, absolutely. I mean, the, the key to that is, is, is trying to catch sleep wherever you can. So I, I can knock out on planes. I can sleep just about anywhere. So <laughs> try to get your sleep in because that's so important. I was sleeping right before this, I, I, I swear. Um, so TMI. <laughs> no, no. So uh, definitely uh, sleep. And then your, your nutrition, right? You have food. to try to keep your food, try to eat as healthy as you can, because if you start loading your body up with a lot of unhealthy food, you're going you're gonna to weaken your immune system, and then you're going to get sick, and you don't want that. That's yeah. not good. Yeah. KFC and Taco Bell might have did me here. <laughs> All right. First up, come on over, and let's ask the man a question. And thank you for coming out, Bad Boy Bill. We Thanks appreciate for having you. Me. Thank you. You guys give it up for him. Hey, Bad Boy Bill. Uh, my name is Scott. I actually grew up in Chicago. I grew up listening to you on B96. I'm oh. from Naperville. Oh, nice. So uh, it was really a pleasure to, you know, actually get to see you here. But, um, you know, just listening to your music and as you, you know, uh, developed more into, you know, Everyone, when they hear you and they see you behind those decks, you know, you're a man of great confidence. What made you get to that point where you could go anywhere behind the decks and 
just do you and don't have to even worry about the audience because they're follow they're going to follow you regardless. Yeah, I mean, it just comes from practicing and 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 DJing as much as I was DJing. Uh, that's really what it what it takes. It just takes a lot of, you know, uh, of time and and like the difference is is that some people maybe DJ an hour a day. You know, I was DJing eight hours a day. You know what I mean? I was I was coming home from school and I would DJ till it was midnight. And my dad would be yelling at me, go to sleep, and then I would get up in the you know morning, go to school, and then go back home and mix all day. And I didn't have that many records. I had like maybe five or six records and I just kept mixing in between them because I, I didn't have a lot of money. So um, I became really good at just knowing my equipment, knowing how to, how, you know, I could do it almost effort, effortlessly. And then when you put, because whenever you get in front of a crowd, you're going to do worse than you're going to do at home in a perfect environment. So as long as your skills are perfect at home, when you get out, you're going to make some mistakes, you know, in front of people. But is you know that's that's what's going to happen but you just don't want to be average at home and then you get out there and then you're bad in front of people so um that's really the goal is just to keep practicing as much as you can and, and get better at it and you know the, the biggest thing that really helped me is when we were mixing live on the radio because that's that's all the pressure in the world right there i was i was 16 and we used to broadcast live from the taste of chicago and I went down there, and it was DJing live on the radio. And you're thinking, man, this, if I move this needle, this is going to broadcast. Well, you're, you're freaking out, you know? But after you do it for a while, then it's like nothing can really phase you. It's like, you know, I've already been in the highest pressure situations. And so. Thank you for that question. Once again, guys, give it up. Once again, we're going to bring it on home. Next person up. We're going to bring on home the importance of practice. I know I went over that in my class Thank today. You. Like. Practice. He said he had four or five records. You don't have to have a lot to practice with, but you must practice a lot. And that was very, very cool to, to let them know but that. But you have to have doubles of every record. That's the yeah. thing. Yeah. You had to have two copies. If At least doubles. Copies, yeah, if you didn't have two copies of the same record, You're you done. couldn't do anything. Yeah, so you had to have two copies. All right, state your name and uh, ask uh, Bad Boy Bill a question. My name's Andrew. I go by DJ Big Red out here. And my question was sort of on the liners of that last question. Like, your first major gig, like, what were your emotions? What were your feelings towards that? Um, and how, how do you think it really went? It went horrible. <laughs> it was a disaster. No, I didn't know what I was doing. I was, I was like, a, I think a freshman in high school that year, and I got booked to do the school dance because we were, you know, like, you know, the homecoming people were all like, oh, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if it was homecoming or whatever dance it was. And I didn't, you know, I, I thought, you, you know, I had this, like, pair of Gemini speakers or something. I don't know. We were, like, and I, and I went to Radio Shack because I was, like, I'm going to have to put these speakers far away from the setup to broadcast it into the gym. And I didn't know anything about hooking up speakers. So I bought all this speaker wire and kind of mangled it all together. Didn't realize that I was crossing positives and negatives. The amp literally caught on fire. It was, like, <laughs> flames coming out of the amp. The sound went <laughs> off. It was a disaster, and then luckily, some one of my friends went home, got his dad's amp, and we hooked everything up. But it was it was not good, you know. And, and that's what happens, you know. You, you know. But I learned from that, and uh, and yeah. So but he kept going. Kept going, you know. That's the point. Absolutely. You must fall on your face at some point. Thank you. That was a great question. Good question. You must fall on your face at some point in order to know how to walk, right? So if you stop. You'll never learn. So that was, I'm glad, you know, you being honest. Yep. Next up, I know who that is. Captain K. State your name. Uh, my name's James. I go by uh, DJ Caveman. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, what's the number one thing you look for when you see, like, a young DJ and you're willing to, like, put his songs out there and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, again, it comes down to their production, right? So... Uh, a lot of guys will hand me a mix CD and be like, hey, listen to my mix. And really, that does nothing for me. I can't help you with that. I'm not a promoter. I don't book nightclubs. So what you really got to hand me is, hey, here's my new track that I just finished. You know, tell me if you like it or maybe you want to put it on your label or, you know, you want to play it in your DJ set. So that's really what you can do as an as a up-and-coming DJ is, is, you know, give your tracks to other DJs, you know, whether it's to, for me to put it out or whether it's just for me to even play it. So... That's, that's really what, what you have to focus on. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Next person. It's basically also, you know, to, to parlay on what he's saying, is create your own buzz. You must create your own buzz. Nobody's going to do that for you. Nobody's going to walk you through you. 
you are your own promoter. You must create a buzz for yourself in order for people to take you seriously. You could be the baddest DJ in, on your block, but if you stay in your bedroom and nobody knows you, it's not going to happen. So create your own buzz. State your name. Student of the year. Thank you guys very much. Create my own buzz. My name is DJ Ascension. You can find me spinning all over the valley. Check my show schedule on Facebook, whatever. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just following advice here. I really don't like to talk about myself. But um, <laughs> so my question for you, uh, thank you very much for coming out here, by the way. Thank you. Um, my question for you is, how did you deal with the scrutiny of being one of the first DJs to scratch and incorporate turntablism with faster BPM house and dance music? And I mean, even to this day, there's still people that, that kind of frown on that. Mm hmm. Well, you know, when we started out, it wasn't like that. You know, nobody really frowned on it because, uh, you know, I grew up listening to the guys on the radio in Chicago, and they were doing that. Like, that was kind of normal for us. It was mixing. Like, the guys in my neighborhood literally would take two copies of Prince Purple Rain and start doing tricks with it. Like, they literally would be scratching with Purple Rain, and, and that's what I grew up around. So there was no ever going to be any scrutiny. For us, it was, that's normal. Um, Scrutiny, I don't know where that even came from. So if people want to scrutinize, you know, your way of expressing yourself, that's that's kind of their thing. It's more like do your thing, you know, and, and then either get it, they either get get with it or, you know, whatever, you know, let them go. So that's 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 my advice on that. Thank you. Um, I got one more question, if you don't mind. All right, cool. Um, I see you kind of drawing a blank now that I'm standing right in front of you. Um, <laughs> do that. Um, and that, that, that goes to say that what he's saying is that was the form of music in Chicago. Right. Is what he's saying. Like, so your region, you got to bring your region to the world. So because other people have different tastes in music, that's just like Atlanta. Atlanta, they had crunk music. They had their own. So we might have been frowning on crunk music when we first heard it. Little John and all that. We like, yo, what is that? So at that point in time, he was doing what was, you know, the norm and what was popular for his region because you have to get a fan base at home first. You must. When I wanted to be on 1580K, they, I had to get a base in Los Angeles first. If you can't get respect in your own hood, then you're no good. <laughs> but a lot of times to get ultimate respect, you have to be blow up outside your city. And then when you come back, all of a sudden they love you. That's just that, what happens. That's true. <laughs> but, but that's true. So what, but, but I'm just saying... You got to test the waters. They're going to love you at first in your own neighborhood, but they're going to hate on you when you start getting some buzz. <laughs> that's, the, that's the natural progression. In the beginning, it's like, oh, okay, okay, we came out to see you, man. He ripped it. Then after a while, oh, he's about to rip it again. <laughs> and they're on the bill with you. See, so, yeah, he's right. Then after that, the whole world starts buzzing, and now everybody want to claim you. So are you ready now for him? Let's get it. Ready, oh, Blake, one second. Can I interrupt? Blake um, we used to drive from Sholo to Scottsdale just to take these classes when we first started offering these classes. Wow. Yeah, about three hours one way. Crazy. And, uh, That's wow. hardcore, bro. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I held a DJ residency up there in the White Mountains. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I was spinning for like six hours. And then I would come down here and drive during the week. So. It was, it was tough, man, going back and forth every week, but absolutely worth it. So staying along the line of buzz, that's Vertigo over there. Check him out, Vertigo Music. He's, he's got podcasts all over the world. He's dope. <laughs> all right, so speaking, speaking of the buzz and, and generating your own buzz, there comes to the point where it's like so much, trying to handle all the social media sites on your own and doing everything. At one point, did you realize that you needed a manager to help you with these things, and what was your first consideration in getting the right manager for you? So is it a manager for the social sites or just a manager for your career? Yeah, a general talent manager to handle booking agents okay. and, and as well as gotcha. all of the social media. and everything. Yeah, I mean, you know, as far as when I started out, I was managing myself. I was booking myself. I was taking all the phone calls. I was, you know, handling everything. And I think most DJs have to do that when they start out. When it gets to the point where you can't handle it, when you're making enough money and you're like, you know, I've got eight gigs this month and I've got a figure out my flights and I got, then a, you can go to a booking agent and be like, listen, I need help because, and if you're making money, they'll, they'll probably bring you on because they know they're going to make their percentage off you. 
Uh, a lot of people think it works in reverse where you go to a booking agent and you sign to them and all of a sudden all the bookings are going to start flowing in. It doesn't work that way. It's the opposite. They won't even mess with you until you have done your work to get you to the point where you're making and generating money. Um, so it basically, came, for me, came to a point where I just couldn't physically handle it no more. And then I, I went and approached a couple you know, booking agents and, 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 uh, and then they took over my schedule. And then for management, it's a different, whole different animal as well. A manager wants to take a percentage of what you're making. And again, if you're not making enough money, it's not worth their time unless they, they see a lot of potential in you and, and are going to put in their time. And then they're going to make you sign a contract because they don't want you to help blow you up and then you just leave them, you know what I mean? Which isn't fair to them either. So, um, but that's, that's kind of, you have to kind of judge that. And you have to make sure you get the right manager because you don't want to sign to somebody for a long-term contract and they haven't proven themselves either. And then you, you don't know you might be stuck in a contract with a manager that's not really helping you out. So management is a, is a weird one. Bookings is a different story. It's a lot, a lot easier to, to, to figure that out. But management is, you have to be careful with managers. Uh, Bill, so um, it's, it kind of like takes a team, right, to make things happen at all? Or? I mean, it does and it doesn't. You know, I mean, you can kind of make it happen on your, on your own if, if you put the time and effort in. But when you're trying to juggle touring, studio, DJing and then doing all that other stuff. It's, you know, it is a lot. It's a lot to handle for anybody. But as you're coming up, you don't have that many bookings. You don't have the, the constant flights and hotels and all the stuff you're dealing with. So at that point, you should be able to handle most of your social media and your website and making sure all that stuff is tight on your own. Cool. Thank you very much. Last and final question. What is your personal favorite VST plugin for production? I'll tell you, my favorite is the UAD plugins. I have the uh, Octo cards that I just did, that I just got, and uh, well, before they had the Quad cards. But those UAD plugins are some of the best, high, highest quality plugins you can uh, you can get. So I would say, you know, if you can afford the whether it's a Satellite or an Apollo or the Octo card or Quad card, I would I would definitely highly recommend the UAD plugins. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Ascension. <laughs> Next up, state your name and. Give them a question. Hi, my name is Andrew as well. Um, I'm in transits, sorry, I'm in transits uh, production class and we're just learning Ableton. And I've been in Logic for two, three years and I switched to Ableton and it's like Aladdin, it's like a whole new world. Right. And so <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm wondering what you see in the future of uh, using Ableton to perform instead of using split decks in a mixer. I mean, do you see things like Dead Mouse and other producers using Ableton Fully instead of just using CDJs. Yeah, not for me because the fun part of me of DJing is is the DJing. You know what I mean? When you're using Ableton, yeah, I mean it's it kind of puts everything on beat for you and you're pushing buttons and stuff. But that I don't I don't know. That's just not my mentality. So I don't really I can't really DJ with it. I know people do, um, but for me, I I still would gravitate towards CDJs or even if I was to use Serato with turntables, I'd rather do that just because it it gives me more control. I almost feel like and I can. I don't know, maneuver better or something. I don't know, maybe it's just because I grew up that way, but that's that's the way that I do it. But I, I don't I don't knock anybody who's using whatever format they're using as long as they're putting effort into it and not just standing there clapping their hands and and you know making a joke of themselves. So, um, but yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever you like to use, you know. So you don't see the DJ going the way the dinosaur at all anywhere. I don't. I mean, I don't. But you know. I mean, I think that there's always going to be a need for DJing, whether whatever form that people are going to present music in, whether it's iPads. I don't, you know, I don't know how they're, how you know younger people are going to start doing it. But for me, I'm I'm still kind of old school, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do it the way I'm gonna do it. But again, it doesn't matter how you're doing it; it just matters what's coming out of the speakers and if you're doing a good job with it. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. State your name. Your DJ MC name. <laughs> so my name's Jose Garcia. They call me uh, Seymour, Seymour Butts. <laughs> and um, my question to you is, what really inspired you to be a DJ? And was it like a song, or did you see somebody? Or you know what? It was. Um, let me try to think back. I would say you know it was kind of like the breakdancing movement was just starting, and and you'd see these movies like Break In and Beat Street. These are like and you see the DJ and they're cutting, and I just thought scratching was the coolest thing ever. I was like, man, I gotta learn how to make those noises. And I thought you'd buy the record, and then the record 
would make a certain noise. I didn't understand it, you know what I mean? So I was trying to figure it out. Um, but that was really, I would say, the whole breakdancing scene. And, and I actually was started off as a breakdancer, but I wasn't that great at it. So I had to stop doing that and, and, and get into the DJing and making the, the mixes for, for breakdance crews and all that stuff. So that was kind of what got me into it. And how old were you when you um, I started when I was 14. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Good answers. Good questions. Very good questions, guys. Hi, I'm, my name is Clarissa. I'm just starting out, and I was just wondering, um, when did you know, like, how long did it take you to f to feel like you were ready to present your, you know, your craft to the world? Or I thought I was ready immediately, but I wasn't. You know, that's the problem. Somebody should have told me, dude, you're not ready, but they didn't. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, y you know, you learn stuff along the way. The, the key is is how many, like it goes back to how much time you're spending per day, right? So if you're only spending an hour a day, it might take you three years, four years. If you're spending eight hours a day, you know, it's going to take you a lot shorter a time to get your skills to, the, to that level. Um, and, or, and also your instructors, right? You're, if you're at a good school here, you're going to learn faster. I had to learn on my own, you know what I mean? Like I'm trying to figure it out. It's going to take longer unless, you know, but if you come to a place like this and you've got great instructors, you're going to learn that much quicker as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. And by the way, for the record, I will tell you you're not ready. <laughs> I will also tell you when you are ready. I'm known for that too. So we got to be honest. Honesty is key. State your name. Hello, my name is Amethyst. I just go by Am. Um, one of my questions was how you started to be a DJ, but you kind of already answered that. So yeah. my other question was, um, what kept you, like, whenever you started DJing, you know, you said you were kind of, like, going on the radio, and even before that, I know that before it was just all a dream, you know? So, like, you see it in the long run, and then it's kind of just, like, tunnel vision, but in between, how did you keep going, and what sort of things, you know, you know, kept you going and gave you inspiration and right. keep doing it? That's a good question. Um, you know, the, the thing is, is when you first start out, you kind of got to do everything. So I started throwing my own parties. You know, I started promoting. I, st I threw a party just basically so I could DJ at it. You know what I mean? Like that's, you got to do whatever you got to do. So that was, was kind of motivating me. I started entering little DJ battles in my neighborhood and, and any little thing that I could DJ at and, you know, we, Right now, you get kind of like, if somebody puts you on a flyer and they, didn't, they don't tell you about it or they try to do it like sneaky, you're like, oh man, dude, I gotta get my money. You put me on the flyer. When I would be mad if they didn't put me on the flyer. Like I was trying to get my name out there, so I would be like, I don't care about the money. I just want my name on the flyer. I want to DJ in front of people. And so that was kind of my, my mindset. It was you know throw parties, whatever you have to do. I started, the biggest thing I did is I started hiring guys from the radio. So I would throw a party and, and book the guys that I was look, listening to and looking up to and then and then I became kind of in their circle. You know, they, they knew who I was, and, and, and that was really uh, beneficial for me as well. So what would you say, like, your best advice for me or anybody else in here who's, you know, aspiring to do so? What would be your, you know, your best advice going through that and then kind of getting, you know, turned down? You know, you have bad shows. You know, you always have setbacks. So what would be? Yeah, you just have to keep at it. You know, just keep working. Don't don't get frustrated. I mean, it's it's going to happen, but you just have to 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 know that. Listen, you're going to get better. It's going to take time, but but you know everything's not going to fall into place perfectly. You know, it's going to take time, and and there's going to be bumps in the road, and it's bumpy. You know, and uh, just stick with it. Stay your course, and uh, and who knows how far you can go. You know, if if you stick with it and and, and really work hard. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, but. I go by, um, my name is Brian, I go by I Made These Beats, and um, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I've been listening to you since I was 12 years old. I'm from Chicago. Um, cool. I grew up going to the whole warehouse party scene and nice. watch you just develop over the years. You know, I listened to you when you were dropping down like tracks like Percolator on the radio, right, right. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, my biggest question to you today is, um, what were some of the biggest adversities that you faced or challenges that you faced and that you still maybe continue to face to this day? You know, it's probably hard. But. Yeah, it's a tough question. You know, uh, I really don't focus on adversities. I mean, the fun, I can tell you a funny thing is when I first got on the radio and people were hearing my mixes and I started getting booked, uh, I showed up at the parties and they were like, they, they thought I was black. 
And that was like, they're like, you're not Bad Boy Bill. And I'm like, dude, I'm Bad Boy Bill. And they literally would not believe me. I'm sitting there arguing with promoters because they had never seen me. They just heard me on the radio. So that was, that was. That's, <laughs> that's a the compliment. Of, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the type of I'll stuff. take that as a compliment, by the way. <laughs> any, any other questions? Thank you. They say most people don't get the roses while they're still living. So thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. I love that statement. I love that phrase. Come on up, man. State your name and give them a question. Hello, Brad. Uh, my name is Ricardo. I'm going to shoot out three questions really quick and okay. <laughs> yes, see if you can answer them. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Number one, um, what is what is your thoughts about DJs getting booted out of the booth when people know or promoters know why they're getting them? Farina, for example, DJ yeah. Shadow. Yeah. Uh, Kerry Collins over in uh, Paris asking him to play uh, David Guetta when right. they know that he doesn't play David Guetta. I don't think you've made it till you've been kicked out of the booth. You know, like that, that, that's when you know you're doing it right. Because if you're, if you're not getting kicked out of the booth, you know, you're, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're conforming to crap music, you know, whatever they want you to, to do. Like, I'll give you an example. I was in Miami Tuesday night. They kept asking me for hip hop. I don't play hip hop. You know, I, I mix I mix a couple of records that go from house to hip hop and back to house. But same thing. I was like, dude, you know what? Just let me just cut my set short. And I, I cut myself. And I was like, dude, listen, I'll just play an hour instead of two hours. And and then you can put somebody on who's going to play that because it's not I don't I don't. First of all, I don't even have that music. I don't carry it around. And secondly, that's not what I do. You know what I mean? But again, a lot of these club owners, you know, they panic. They want this. Their bottle service people are telling them we you know, they want this music and they're spending a lot of money and I get it. So whatever, you know, if that's what they want, you know, I already got paid. So go. Cool. <laughs> All right. My second question deals with synthetic DJs. Those are the guys that just go ahead and do their mix in the house. I mean, whatever, say Calvin Harris, people that have been caught actually putting something already done, pre done and put it out to the public. What is your feeling about that? And is that becoming epi an epidemic now? It depends on why you're doing it. You know, like I've seen people were talking about the Steve Angelo situation, and I know Steve Angelo can DJ. It's just, they, you know, I guess he had to do like a little pre-recorded thing because they had pyrotechnics or whatever. And a lot of times that happens. It's like you might have to do a little pre-recorded segment. So I get it. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But if, you are, if you're just DJing, um, you know, I've heard of DJs that literally don't know how to DJ, they put in a mix CD and they jump around, that's a, a disgrace, you know what I mean? But you know, that's, that, that's what I look down upon. But if you're doing it more for your production value and you have to have your visuals and your lighting cues and all that stuff sync together and it's your performance, I get it, you know, I understand. You know, you have to do it. And finally, for my last question as a producer, um, what is your favorite uh, software, DAW? I'm using uh, Ableton right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, great questions, <laughs> wonderful questions. Come on up. State your name. Uh, Michael Bullis. I go by uh, Bullis Beats. I make like hip hop produ productions. Cool. Sorry. Cool. Uh, I just had a couple questions about like m marketing and like making a brand and stuff like that. Okay. So like how like you started off as four at fourteen. How did you afford like put your name out there when you had a plan at fourteen? Like uh, did it change at all throughout the way and like to become world known? Like. Yeah, I mean. Did it, did your plan go through as you planned, or did it change like a ton? I didn't even really have a plan, up to be honest with you. No, I didn't. Honestly, didn't. I, I, I didn't even know you could make money DJing. Like I, I just enjoyed the art of it, and I just mixed in my bedroom for hours. Didn't even care about money. Didn't care about fame. There wasn't really a fame around DJs, as far as I was concerned. It was just you know something I did, and I, my guys in my neighborhood would do, and we would just do it for fun. Um, but uh, as far as marketing, you know. Everything is image based, right? And, and, and perception based. Right now, we live in a world where people go to, go to go to your website immediately or go to your Facebook or go to your SoundCloud. And everything, they don't know if what the reality of it is. It'd be, if your artwork looks good and the way you're presenting yourself looks good and your website looks cool and your, the sounds that they're hearing when they go to your website or your SoundCloud is, is sounding good, that's all that matters. You don't need a huge staff, you don't need a big office space. Like, all that stuff is irrelevant. You know, what's most important is your imaging and your perception and, and what you're putting out there. Make sure everything that you put out, out there is at the highest quality that you can make it because you never know what, who's gonna be looking at it and who's gonna judge you and be like, ah, oh, it doesn't look that great, I'm not gonna book him. Or, man, you know, his artwork's a little off or 
it looks cheap. He must be cheap. You know what I mean? Or whatever. So always make sure you're, whatever imagery and whatever stuff you're putting out there is, is the best you can make it. Or you're hiring good graphic designers or whatever you need to do to make sure your stuff looks and, and sounds as good as possible. Um, I wanted to kind of elaborate on that, Bill, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, see, myself and Bill come from a time when actually we kind of put the money in the game. It wasn't like we looked up and there were people around us that were making tons of money. You know, anybody started circa the 80s, 83s and 86s. There wasn't like if we saw somebody doing it, they were Run DMC and people from the East Coast and saying what, what he's saying is we didn't do this for the money. And a lot of you guys watch cribs and things of that nature and you start preoccupying yourself with how much money you're going to make without getting good if you're good the money will come i just had this conversation with my class on wednesday get good they say get money well get good and the money comes automatically correct 100 percent. and then you got to look at people like dr dre in the hip-hop scene where he went through three labels before he got money you know, he was on World Class Wrecking Crew. He went to Ruthless Records, and then he had to leave um, Death Row with nothing. Yep. And now Aftermath, how long did he stay hot in order to be the guy that just made $100 million off headphones? You understand? He had to stay hot. He said he's been out of the studio for two weeks. The guy's like 47 years old. I, I grew up with him. I know. I used to go from high school to his house when he lived with his aunt. So I'm trying to tell you guys, don't preoccupy yourself with the money. Get good and do this because you love it and the money will come. Would you agree? I agree. I mean, if you look at Dre. He's, he wasn't doing it for the money if he wasn't getting paid. He was doing it because he loved producing. He loved working in the studio. He loved creating dope records. And that's why he's successful today, you know. And, and I think it's, it's very important, man. Just, just you have to work on your skills. If you, if you get in this for the money, you're not going to make it. This, this business is too hard. You know, you, the money's not going to come quick. I know a lot of guys that got into it, they try for a year or two, and then they, they're like, I can't do it. It's because they thought they were going to jump in and make a lot of money. It's not going to happen immediately. Thank you for bringing that up. Great point. <laughs> State your name. My name is Ryan Hoffman. Um, I'm a uh I go by Ryan Hoffman, but uh, for <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, it's uh, it was crazy to see that you were here tonight at uh, at SCC mainly because it's a community college, and um, I happen to be interning for Craig Palm, who uh, Nate Palm on your latest track, right, right. and um, for so for you to be here tonight was like kind of weird to me, but it was really cool at the same time. Uh, anyway, my question is. When you're producing a song, because um, I've been producing for a couple of years now, and um, when you're producing a song, do you know instantly as you're making it that this is going to sound incredible, or do you need time off from the song before you go back to listen to it and you kind of say to yourself, oh, this is good, I can work with this, and um, play, it, play it out? You know, a lot, most of the time I think what I'm making is not good, and it takes time to, to mold it and shape it. Really, it's the decisions you're making in the studio the subtle changes that's going to take it from something that's, you know, but then again, you could start with something, you could try to polish it forever, and it's a turd is a turd, you know what I mean? So you got to know when to cut it off to and say, okay, I, this, this track's not happening, i got to move on. So it, it's a kind of a, a, a combination of both, to answer your question. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you, you know, it's not going to come immediately either. You know, some, t some tracks do come together pretty quick, and you can kind of tell this is happening. But other tracks, it takes time, you know, and, and you have to mold them and shape them. All right, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up. State your name, baby. I'm Gus Myers, DJ Tunes. I'm just wondering, uh, what's your number one tip for people that I'm stuck in my bedroom DJing right now? You know, I don't have. There's I don't nothing wrong with here. that. Yeah, I don't have the ability to be around and going around town right now. But I want to know what's the number one thing to be practicing as far as mixing, as far as turntablism, and as far as producing. Where should I get 100%? Um, out of the three right now, as, as you're just starting out, what should you work on the most? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, I would say all of them, but, you know, it, it is difficult to work on all of them. But, you know, 
take a break from one. I mean, all of them individually. Yeah, I mean, you have to work on them all individually because they all they kind of interact with each other, right? So if you're DJing and you have the access to Ableton, you can kind of start creating your own edits of songs. You can learn that. You can start doing your mixes in Ableton. You could also... Um, you know, as far as producing, you could make your own track, put that into Ableton, which is part of your mix now. So it's kind of like doing them all is what really what's going to, to benefit you at this point. Um, that's what I, that's, that would be my advice. I'm talking more about like uh, the one tip, the one trick that I should really perfect in each one. Oh, the one aspect. trick in each one. Yeah. There is no, there's no trick, man. It's like the whole thing is, is what you have to work on. It's not like a, uh, a magic button that you can press and, and, and each, and it's each. It's called sync. Yeah. Oh, there is a button. You're right. That's a bad button. That's a cheating button. I don't like that button. Cheaters. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's, I would, uh, there's really not one. Let's break down your question real quick. So you, you produce. DJ and what else? That that's everything is too broad. So you D, okay? Let me let me let me let me, turntablism. Okay. okay. Most of your top notch producers were DJs in the beginning. Okay. So basically, they perfected DJing, and they hear so much music, they're able to identify hooks, breaks portions of those songs, dissect them. Once again, Bad Boy Bill is a living example. He started off DJing. So maybe you don't want to try to be a director if you haven't tried acting or screenwriting. You might want to perfect the DJing and listen to the songs and then start to get the elements of song producing down pat and then go on to become a dope producer. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean... But for me as well, like I was 14 when I started DJing. When I was 15, I bought my first drum machine. So I bought a 909, I bought a 303, I bought a, a, a bunch of equipment. I bought a sampler, you know, when I was 15 as well. And I started sampling. Uh, it was an Akai X7000 sampler. It was old school, probably had like three seconds of sampling time or whatever. It was crap. But, you know, I started learning my little skills as well as, as producing. And a lot of my early hot mixes... Um, People were bugging out, like, how are you doing that? How, you know, like they would listen to my mixes and they hear these intros and I'd have songs coming in and out. They didn't realize I was using studio equipment. I was using stuff that people would use in a studio on songs, but I was using it for production on a mix CD. So I had, I would have, you know, literally the whole, I would sample the best parts of every song and re trigger them and come up with intricate intros that you could never make with just two turntables and a mixer. So, Using studio production and Ableton stuff and, and incorporating it into DJing is is it's all going to work together if if you can if you can do it. But again, you're right. The focus for me was always on DJing at first. You know that's that is the basis. That, did that did you all... use like a four track or eight track along with your uh, when you were doing your mixes? I you know what it, it started out as reel to reel. Really? I would I would do a lot of the stuff and then record it to reel to reel and then. It moved into a dat dat tape and Absolutely. then we would use sound tools, which is sound design, which is the early early, early Pro Tools. It was the first thing, because it was late 80s that came out, and it was, um, I would record everything to DAT, and then I would put it into the computer, and then I would edit, you know, do some more edits. How, how many computer. tracks would you say you were using up? That was just two track, just two track tracks. editing. Yeah. Okay. But, but I would put so much into that, you know <laughs> what I mean? No, there would be like multiple things playing, Okay. Um, and then I would be able to edit that down. Did, did that help you a little? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. State your name. It's me again. Hey, what's up? Andrew, Big Red. <laughs> um, anyways, um, this is more of a question about like your opinion on something. It's, um, it's kind of like a big issue in the DJ world right now that I, I've noticed. A lot of people are talking about it. And um, what do you think about like the DJs that got their fame from, say, like reality shows like uh, Obi-Wan and... Uh, Polly D. Polly D. <laughs> Yeah, what, what, what's your take on this, and, you know, where do you see that going? Hey, man, you know, Polly D puts people in the club, and, and he, he gets girls to come out. If I was a club owner, I'd want to book him, too, because he's going to load your club full of hot girls. So I get it, you know what I mean? I understand, I understand the thing behind it. You know, if his skills aren't up to par, you know, hopefully he's working on that and getting them up to par. Um, 
that's the one thing I would say, you know, is, is it, it doesn't matter how you get there. If you get there, just make sure that when you do get there that you're, you've, you put in some work and you're, you're, you're doing a good show. You know, beyond that, I don't, I don't care how you get there, whatever. All right. Got a question? All right. So uh, what's the biggest mishap you've had at every one, uh, one of your shows and what did you do to overcome it? My name is Julian. I go by DJ Smooth. Thank you, Ramsey. I've had so many mishaps. You know, it, it's it would I could sit here all night and talk about mistakes and problems. You know, the biggest one I you know is picking up the wrong needle. Like back in the day, you'd pick up the wrong, and, and all of a sudden the, it's silent in the club, and you're like, uh oh, and then you put it back down. You know what I mean? Like that is probably the biggest one that would you know you forget which side you're on, and you're like, oops. You know, that really doesn't happen probably as much because you're using CDs or whatever or whatever you're using, but. That was a, always a big problem. But I mean, there was, you know, uh, there's always going to be problems, you know, and you just have to, you know, sometimes you have to play it off like it was part of your, you were trying to do that. You know what I mean? Like people don't know. They're like, oh, maybe he was trying to do some crazy stuff, you know, whatever. Like I've, I've seen the whole sound system cut out and people start cheering. They think it's, you know, they think it's part of the show. Like you just cut the music and they start cheering, but they don't realize it's not coming back on, you know, so. <laughs> 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 do, so, do you do you MC while DJing? I personally don't. I usually uh, have somebody that MCs, or I or I don't do any, or I have like little vocal drops and stuff that I play off of uh, off of my uh, whatever turntable or CDs or whatever I'm using. So, uh, but no, me personally, I don't MC. I need to come to your class and then I'll be all good. <laughs> hey, has the has the MC? If if you guys have been together, has the MC ever saved you in the middle of a mishap? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, definitely MCs can come to your to your rescue. They can uh smooth out situations, you know. It's 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 good having somebody there that can handle those situations and they handle it a lot better than I would handle it. So it's it's good. Yeah, let your let your music drop on me. We good. <laughs> I got you. I got you, Bill. Yeah. All right. Last we got a, you got another question too? All right, let me get state your name. I'm Josh and I go by uh, Vogue 303 for my DJ name. And uh I was wondering if you use analog or digital or a mixture of both or just one or the other in the studio yeah um I, right now i have both you know but for the most part i'm using uh digital um but in, in certain sense situations like i have you know moog voyager i have certain memory Moog keyboards i have certain specific things that i've kept around that i enjoy like my my 303 my my acid you know baseline machine like i'll you i'll pull some of that stuff out because they're there's still something about it that it's hard to to recreate in a VST. You know, they're they're getting closer, and I think in a few years, I think the VSTs will be just about you know indistinguishable from analog because they're really the, the processing is getting so good and stuff. But for right now, I still like to mix between the two two worlds a little bit if I can. I got one more question. Okay. Uh, since you use Ableton, do you like session view or arrangement view? When I'm first starting a track, I kind of use session view um, just because it lets me experiment a little bit more. And then, but pretty quickly, I, I move over to the, uh, to the uh, what's it called? Arrange. Arrange view. Yeah, I move quickly over to that just because I, I don't know, I kind of like seeing it. Um, but you kind of have to have your parts ready. So once, you know, once I've got my bass lines and all this stuff, that, then, I'll, then I'll switch to that, or, to that view pretty quickly. Right on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the student of the year, DJ Ascension. Hey, what's up? My name is DJ Big Red. No. <laughs> no. Um, my question is, you know, especially you being such a huge integral part of Beatport, you just have tons of new music coming at you. How much of your sets nowadays, especially the one tomorrow night at Wild Night, how much do well, you prepare and how much do you perform live, like percentage-wise? Um... You know, I like to have a few songs set so I kind of can get into my flow. You know, so like my first maybe four or five songs, they're usually going to probably be the same. Uh, I'm going to figure that out beforehand. Uh, but beyond that, then I kind of got to start reading the crowd. I got to figure out what's working, what's not working. Uh, but then what I kind of do is I'll start maybe altering from my kind of pre-programmed mindset. And then 
I might play three or four songs kind of that I just I'm putting together and then I might go into a chunk of three or four songs that I know I'll work together and then I might go again back into some songs that I'm trying different things so I kind of go in between chunks of pre-programmed stuff that I know this song goes well into this song and then I'll go into I don't know what you know I'll try something maybe I'll go from this song and I've never done it before but I'm gonna go into this song you know and and it's it's kind of a, a mix and match of both I don't know the percentages but it's kind of I have to play each you know gig by ear and kind of look at the crowd and figure out what, what I want to do. Thank you. So you're in Tucson tonight and then at Wild Night here in Old Town tomorrow Tomorrow night, night correct. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Anything? You got a question? Bring it, bring it to him, bring it to him. Bring a, bring an OG question <laughs> to the table. All right, I got a question for you and it, it, it's probably going to be uh, a, a little bit. F oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of my, yeah, I love teaching this guy. He's great. Um, oh, yeah, I am Ramsey Higgins. <laughs> I am Ramsey Higgins. I am inst the instructor of the of MUC 136 turntablism class. Okay. Uh, right here at Scottsdale Community College. Now, I, I do want to have a question for you, but I will elaborate on something that I've known that you've done over the years. Since, since I've been, uh, me and Transit and Rob, we've been listening to you since, you know, Egyptian days. Right. One of the things I know about Bill is that he feels his music. When he's back there spinning, he's not just selecting songs on one level that's that's okay but one of the things i do know that he does is he feels it from his soul and if you don't know how to get or tap into that that's something that is going to be to your advantage and that's something that i know he was able to do and it reflected the, the, the songs that he picked like he was talking you got to know how to pick apart your audience and that's not easy you never know if Someone in the audience lost a loved one, or someone just lost their job, or I know somebody's celebrating a birthday right now. <laughs> Something to that degree. You gotta be able to pick apart the audience. It's this undisclosed energy that you you're able to pick up. It's not necessarily taught. Um, I know um, that he uses that to his advantage not only for per performing but also in his production. So now I want to know when did you first started understanding that concept? You know the the way you come into that for me at least the way I came into that was you know a lot of DJs would do perfectly smooth sets, right? They would just perfect, you know, it was just everything flowed perfectly. But it kind of was boring. You know what I mean? It just kind of was lame. It was like it's perfect but it's boring. It's not happening. So what what was the problem? The problem is is there's no roller coaster. There's no emotional reaction. There's nothing happening. So a lot of stuff I'll do, it might sound weird. You know, to to you know, maybe like it might jolt you. You might be like, whoa, I, I wouldn't expect that record to come in, or wow, why did he spin that thing back and all of a sudden there's an explosion and it's silence? You know, it's because it's going to create a reaction. It's going to create something that that you're going to be like, oh wow, and it's, it's going to grab you, and that's kind of you know, that's that's kind of been my philosophy on it is you got to mix in between smoothness and and also jolting the audience at certain points. Excellent. If that makes sense. I don't know. Yep. And my last question would be how much of this, how much uh, difficulty, nah, nah, wrong way, how easy was it for you to jump into production and use, go from DJing into production and how much did it help you as far as guiding your concepts of where you wanted to go, as far as what you what you wanted to put out? Yeah, I mean, it helped a lot. And, and I started, again, like I was, when I first started DJing, really quickly, within the first year, I was buying equipment, studio equipment. I, I, I just thought samplers were cool and I thought drum machines were cool. And a lot of the guys that I was looking up to that were DJing would bring a drum machine sometimes to their gig and they'd blend into it. Like there was beat tracks in, in Chicago that people, that guys were putting out. It was just a, a record full of different drum tracks. 
and they were popular and they were selling a lot of copies and it was just for the fact that it was cool you know you had a drum machine there at your gig you're, you're, you're blending from a record into the drum machine you've got different things programmed so we kind of grew up on that you know people would use reel to reels too that that was a big thing they would in their dj sets that was you know it, it, you you wanted to play a new song or something that was unreleased how did you how are you going to do it you, you you know you'd have to put it on a reel and it had a pitch control on it and you'd blend in using the reel and now all of a sudden your reel's playing and then you go back to vinyl and and so it was always kind of using whatever technology you could get your hands on to 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 propel your DJing, you know what I mean? And that's kind of been our philosophy, at least in Chicago. That's how we kind of grew up is use drum machines, use samplers, use whatever you can to, to integrate into your DJ sets. And I think it's, it's, it's really cool if you can do that. Guys, give it up. Before you leave, this isn't, this isn't a question. This is a statement I would like to make as being an artist myself and something that I can relate to. Bad Boy Bill has a show tonight, correct? Correct. What time is that show? Uh, it goes on from 9 to 2 a.m. in Tucson tonight. 9 to 2, and Tucson is how far from here? Uh, it's about an hour and 45 okay. minutes. My point, that he took the time out to come here for us before a show. Now, I'm like a boxer before my show. Don't mess with me. I'm in my dressing room getting psyched up, amped up, like... Don't talk to me, baby mama, baby, none of y'all. I don't want to talk because it's warfare. It's warfare. You're going into a fight. We, we analyze, you know, our analogy, analogy is that of a boxer or a warrior. We're going to war. He has a fight scheduled tonight, and he stopped by for you guys to, to, to drop some, some gems on you so that hopefully you will take some of those things and be able to do what he's doing, which is make a living off of your passion. So I really want you guys to stand up on your feet and clap and thank this man for taking the time out to do what he's doing right now before a show. It's we my, thank you. It, it, it's my pleasure and we my honor. We thank you so much, thank Bad you. Boy Bill. No, it's my pleasure and my honor. You know, just to be here and be invited here is it, it means a lot to me. And we've been trying to set this up for a, a while now, and I'm I'm glad that I was able to to make it happen. And and uh, I, I wish everybody out there the best of luck and just stay stay focused, keep working on it. Don't let people that are going to talk crap put you down and all that stuff. Just just do your thing, man. And 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 you you can go as far as you really want to go as long as you keep your Keep your head in the game and, and put your and, and be cool to people. You know what I mean. You have to be nice. You can't walk into a, a DJ booth with an attitude and think you're better than somebody or whatever. You know I don't care if you're touring if you're not. I look at it when I go to a club and I see a, a, a the resident DJ who's there week in and week out. That dude, I'm in his house, man. You know I'm his guest. Absolutely. You know and, and and I appreciate the fact that he's letting me play on his. This is his night. You know he built this crowd and and you know guys like Transit do that. You know they're they're there every week building and molding and, and, and makes it, for me, easy to come in there for an hour or two and, and do my thing. But I appreciate residents. I appreciate everybody. And, and, and be nice. You know, be cool. And, and it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to serve you in the long run. Absolutely. Great advice.